In this episode, the Trinity, people, our purpose, and relationships. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Live Through Jesus with Courtney Gilmore. I'll be reading all the scripture references for you, so you're free to just sit back, listen, and absorb, or you can grab your Bible and read along. Most of the time, I'll be reading from the New King James Version, but if I switch, I'll let you know. At the beginning of each episode, I'll introduce the titles, so if you want the entire study in writing, you can go to livethroughjesus.com and buy it for under $5. Each one will cover two to three months' worth of episodes, and once you buy, then it'll be immediately available for download. In addition to a little extra studying, it also allows you the benefit of some charts and keyword definitions, but it isn't necessary. Okay, so let's get started. This is episode two, and today we'll be going over lesson three of the Creation, Corruption, and Destruction study. Last episode, we read in Genesis 1 and 2, and we talked about the creation week, and it got a little scientific. It's all good stuff and very important to study, but if it was a little too much for you, don't worry, because this week we will still be in Genesis 1 and 2, but we'll be discussing the verses that have to do with people and the family. So it'll be a little more self-application this week. We'll begin by talking a little bit about the Trinity and then the creation of people and what our purpose is and why we were created, and then we'll end with marriage and relationships. So... Our memory verse is found in Genesis 1.27, and it says, In the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. So let's begin by reading Genesis 1.26 and 27. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So we're going to stop right there because we need to talk about the language of this. Who else is with God? Because he continues to say us and our. And so there's someone else there with God at this very moment of creation. It says that we were created in their image as people. And so we need to know whose image we were created in. Now, we do know from last episode at the very beginning in verse 2, it says that the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So we do know that the Holy Spirit was there with God in the beginning when he created everything. So we know that God the Father was there and the Spirit of God was there, which is the Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to look with me in John 1, 1 through 5. This tells us who also was there in the beginning with God. Beginning in verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. So this tells us that the Word was with God in the beginning and that everything that was created was created through Him and for Him. Now skip down to verse 14 and it's going to tell us who the Word is. It says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So this tells us that the Word became flesh and lived among the people on the earth, and that the Word is the only begotten of the Father. So He is the only child born of the Father. This lets us know that Jesus was there in the beginning. So if we go back to John 1, 1 through 5, that lets us know that Jesus was there in the beginning, and that everything that was created was created through Him, and for Him, and by Him. Now, we know that Jesus became flesh and lived on the earth, but let's read about how Jesus became this flesh. Look with me in Matthew 1, 18, and it says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child of the Holy Spirit. 
So Mary became pregnant through the Holy Spirit. That is how she is God's son and not Joseph's. So we have God the Father creating these things through Jesus the Son and the Holy Spirit. This is what we call the Trinity. It's the three persons of God. We have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It says that we are created in their image. So we are created in the image of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Meaning we are created with body like Jesus and we are also created with soul and with spirit. The soul is what gives us our personality, uh, so to speak, and the spirit is what communes with God, put in simple terms at least. Now let's go back to Genesis and let's read in Genesis 2, 7 and learn a little bit about how God created the first man. It says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. So let's take the first part of this where it says, God formed the man out of the dust of the ground. This gives us the picture that he was shaping him out of clay. He's making him in the form that he wants him to be. Isaiah supports this claim in 64, 8. Let me read this to you. It says, But now, O Lord, you are our father, we are the clay, and you are our potter, and we are all the work of your hand. So this gives the picture of God shaping us, molding us, and making us in the form that he chooses. Now let's look at the second part of verse 7 where it says that God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and he became a living being. Now the word here for breath is the same word that they use for spirit in Job 26, 4. Listen to this. It says, To whom have you uttered words and whose spirit came from you, whose breath? came from you. So those words can be used interchangeably. And so what God actually did is he breathed his spirit into the man and gave him life. The spirit is what gives us life. It's what allows us to be alive. So that's how we're made also with a spirit. He gives us, as I said before, bodies and souls and spirits. When we become Christians, we're born again of God. And so the Holy Spirit, the breath of God, now breathes new life into us. So when our bodies die and our breath leaves us, then the Spirit is departing into eternal life. And if we have the Holy Spirit within us, then it goes on to live with God. And if not, then we're eternally separated from Him. Our spirit is what departs from us at death. So that's just a little bit about the Trinity and how we're created in His image. And now we're going to go ahead and move on to what is our purpose? The age-old question, right? Why are we here? Let's first read in Genesis 1.28. It says, Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and every living thing that moves on the earth. So here we see that one of our purposes is to be fruitful and multiply. We are supposed to have children, or at least we were created with that ability and intent. Obviously, everyone is not able, but that was God's plan, is that we would be able to be fruitful and multiply, and that we also are supposed to take care of all of His creation. It says we will have dominion over all of the things that he created. And so our purpose from that verse just tells us that we are supposed to have children and we are supposed to take care of the things that God created. Now let's look at chapter 2 verse 15 and we'll find out a little bit more about what we're created to do. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. Skip down to verse 19. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was his name. So here we see that God created the man not only to take care of the animals, but also to take care of the land. 
So work was not a punishment of the fall. Work was created by God as something good. He intended us to take care of the things that he created. That is our purpose. We are created to be busy and working and doing things that matter. And so that is why we feel empty whenever we have the loss of a job or a handicap that prevents us from doing things, things like that, because we are made with the desire built in us to work and take care of things that God has created, do things that are productive and important. So nothing else is responsible None of the animals can be responsible. The reason that people were created is because we have the capability of taking care of all of his creation. That is our purpose. And then again, we have to be able to multiply. Otherwise, God would have to continue to create people over and over and over again. And as we talked about last week, everything that was created was created during that first week and nothing else was ever to be created again. Now, let's look at women specifically. We haven't talked about the woman yet. Let's begin in chapter 2, verse 18. And it says, The Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was his name. So Adam gave names to all the cattle and the birds of the air and every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. So we're going to stop right there. First of all, we see that the woman was created to be a companion for the man. No animal is capable of being a man's companion the way that a woman is. Dogs are good, you know, but they can't do what people can. God created the woman first to be a companion for the man. And then secondly, he created the woman to help him. Because it says at the end of verse 20, there was not found a helper comparable to him. So the woman was here to help the man with all of the tasks that God had already given to him. As we talked about before, God has told him work, take care of all of the things that I've created. And so the woman was put here to help him in that job. Now, we're not going to get into here whether women are supposed to work outside the home and things like that. I'm going to let men and women decide that for themselves in their own marriage, what works for them and looking throughout scripture and all of those things. But what we do know is that women are supposed to help their husbands in the task that God has for the husband. And so whatever that looks like in your house, just know that the purpose of the woman was to help her husband in his work towards the Lord. That may mean that you literally work together in everything that you do. It may mean that you have a separate task as a woman that helps your husband either financially or by doing things that he is unable to do because he is doing something else. However it is that you and your husband decide that you are to be helpful to him, then that is what you need to do. There's going to be a lot of people that have strong opinions on either side of that, and so I'm not going to take a side on that. What I just want you to know that we can tell from these verses is that the man is tasked with working and taking care of all of God's creation, and that the woman is there to be his companion and his helper in whatever way that he considers helpful. Now, I know that this is not a popular view, possibly, because we like to be independent. We like to think that as women, we can do anything that a man can do, all of that business. None of it is saying that that's not the case. It's just saying that we all have separate roles. And so just as a team, each of us have different roles, different ways that we all accomplish the same goal. That's the way God set it up. 
So before we move on to marriage, I just want you to stop and reflect a little bit and just see, are you fulfilling your purpose, whatever that is that God has created you for? Are you working? Are you being responsible to take care of the things that he's entrusted you with? Are you a good companion? Are you helpful? Are you and your spouse working together to accomplish the goal that you think that the Lord has specifically gifted you to do and asked you to do in this world? I'm sure that all of us can do better, but it's good to stop sometimes and just see how well are we doing on these things? What do we need to improve on? In what areas are we doing well? Things like that. I would suggest that one of the things that you do this week is talk to God about that. Ask Him, is there something that you've created me to do that I'm not doing? Is there a way that I can be fulfilling my purpose on this earth better? Am I a good companion? Am I helpful? I would also encourage you, if you are a woman, to ask your husband, is there some way that I can help you to fulfill the things that God has asked of you to do? If you are a man, I would encourage you to gently, understanding that sometimes this is a hard topic for us women, but gently tell them things that they can do to help you. Let them know the things that they're good at and ways that they can be beneficial to you. Everyone loves to feel needed and wanted. So again, whenever we aren't fulfilling our purpose, we really do not feel well. We feel unsettled when we are unable to do the things that God created us to do, whether we are a man or a woman. And so we have to understand that from each other's perspective and then also understand that if we feel uneasy at times, it may be because we're not really fulfilling our purpose. Now, let's move on to the very last part of what this chapter tells us we were created for. I'm going to read in chapter 2, verse 24. And it says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So on day six, not only did God create man and woman, but he also created the marriage relationship. We are created with the unique ability to be fruitful and multiply because that was his intent. And so there is a reason that men and women are created differently because that is how we are able to fulfill that purpose. And God tells us here that he wants us to be joined together. We are supposed to leave our father and mother and be joined together. And although this is talking um, specifically being joined in the body, I think that God also wants us to be joined in our minds and our hearts and our spirits. And he talks about that all through the rest of the Bible, about being one of mind and one of heart and one of spirit. That's why it's so important that once we're married, we stay together because we are joined so completely that we become one person. And when you separate that, then you end up pulling each other apart. So this verse is quoted all throughout the New Testament. I'm going to read you a couple. The first one is found in Matthew 19, beginning in verse 3. And it says, The Pharisees also came to him, testing him and saying, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And Jesus answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let man not separate. So then they said to him, Why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and put her away? And Jesus said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery, and whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. So Jesus refers to these verses when he's discussing divorce. When they ask him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He said, didn't you hear that in the very beginning, God said that the whole reason that he created man and woman was for them to leave their parents and be joined together and become one flesh. And so he said, 
the famous verse that's much of the time quoted at weddings where it says, whatever God has joined together, let man not separate. And so once God has joined us together and we try to separate what has now become one into two again, then we end up tearing ourselves apart. That's the reason that it doesn't work well because we've been joined together as one. And once you try to do that and separate yourselves again and make yourselves into two, then you start pulling some of them with you and you leave some of yourself behind because there's no way to separate that cleanly anymore because God has joined it together. And so they ask him again, well, why did Moses say that we could give a certificate of divorce? And he said, he told you to do this because your hearts were hard, but this was never God's intent because he knew that it would tear you apart. And so, you know, much of the time we feel like God just gives us a lot of rules and it's difficult to follow all the things that he asks us to do. But he does this for our own benefit because he knows what's good for us and he knows how he intended it to be. And whenever we do it in such a way that it wasn't intended to be in the first place, then it's not going to go as well for us as if we did it in the way that it was created to be done in the beginning. You will also find this same interaction in Mark 10, 1 through 12, where Mark is telling this same story. And we're not going to read that. And then let's look in Ephesians 5, 22. This is Paul, and he also quotes this verse. And he's talking about marriage, and, and he's explaining the role again of what a husband's role is and a wife's role is. And then he's also comparing that to what our role is supposed to be to Jesus as the church. And so I'm going to read, starting in verse 22 of Ephesians 5, it says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are all members of his body, of his flesh and his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So he's using the picture of the relationship between the husband and wife to show us how it is that we're supposed to interact with Jesus. But he quotes this verse letting us know again that we are separate members serving in one body. So we have become one, each working according to one purpose. We find the reason that God created us with these specific roles in 1 Corinthians 11. We're going to just skip a couple of verses because this isn't all that the focus is of this passage. But we're going to look at verse 3. It says, I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of woman is the man and the head of Christ is God. Then we're going to skip down to verse 8. For man is not from woman, but woman is from man. Nor was man created for the woman, but woman was created for the man. Skip down to verse 11. Nevertheless, neither is man independent of woman or woman independent of man in the Lord. For as woman came from the man, even so man also comes through the woman and all things are from God. So this sets it up again for us is the reason that the roles are as they are structured is because we as women were created for the man, but it tells us that we're not independent from each other because we're created for each other and ultimately for God and his glory. Now we're going to look at one more verse that quotes this verse in Genesis 1 
and it's found in 1 Corinthians 6, 15. And this is explaining to us why it is so important to keep our bodies pure. And so it says, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one in body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside of his body, except for the man who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So that's why God tells us not to join ourselves with but one person. Because every time that we join ourselves with someone, then we give a little piece of ourselves to that person. And so his intent is that we will be joined together with one person for our whole lives and that we will become so much a part of that person that we are just one with them we become of the same body, mind, soul, spirit, everything. Now, I want to say that no one completely fulfills God's purpose for their life. And we mess up. God knows that that's going to happen. He knows that we will sin. He knows that we will not fulfill our purposes here on this earth. He knows that we will mess up and have to start again and try again. And that is why he sent his son. And so none of this is intended to condemn anyone that's not doing the things that we're talking about here today. It may be regarding working, taking responsibility for the things that God's entrusted us with, being a good companion, being helpful to our spouse, or staying in a marriage for life. Those are all things that God has called us to do, but they're also things that we fall short of many times. And so if you happen to be in a situation where you've fallen short in one of these areas, that's okay. Just start from where you are and allow God to forgive you and bring you back to what he's intended for you to be in the first place. The purpose of this is just to let us know why we are here, what he wants for us to do, why maybe we're feeling empty or unfulfilled, why maybe there's contention, things like that. Because if once we understand what God's intent was, and if we can see that we are not close to that intent, then we can find out what's going on. And so God writes so much about this because he wants us to take our marriage vows seriously. And so if you are not married yet, then just prepare yourself for a marriage like this. Prepare yourself to do your part in the marriage, fulfill your role, and be a good companion, and to be one. Do not join yourself with someone that is not your spouse. Keep yourself pure in that way. And if you've messed up in that area, that's okay. Just start from here. Again, we can't do anything about the past, and so we just have to use God's grace and mercy for that and just move on and do the things that would please Him from this point forward. No one is blameless. But if you are married, then just take your marriage vows seriously. Soften your hearts. Love each other. Follow the model that God's designed for us. Do whatever it is in your power to take away any type of separation that you may be having in your marriage. Do what you can to join yourself with your spouse through the Lord as He intended. We don't have control over the other person, but we have control over ourselves. So we need to do whatever it is that we can do to take away separation because God never intended us to be two separate people once we were married. It doesn't mean that we're joined at the hip. Every marriage looks different. You have to find what works for you, but it does mean that you're not two separate people anymore. You've joined your life with this other person's life, and so now the two lives have to be meshed. You have to decide how to take care of your finances, how work is going to be delegated. 
you have to decide what you spend your time on, how you raise your children. All of the things that you used to decide by yourself now are going to be decisions made jointly. That's the way God intended it. And so that's what it looks like to join yourself with someone else. I hope that you found this encouraging today and not something that makes you feel that you haven't lived up because again, all of us fall short and God knows that we are going to and we need to know that we're going to and that others are going to also. Our spouses are going to let us down. We are going to let ourselves down. We're going to let our spouses down. We're going to let our future spouses down. It's just the way that that goes. But knowing what God intended for us in the beginning at least helps us to get on the right track. We all like to feel useful and important. And so when we know what it is that God wants us to do, then we can fulfill that purpose and be useful to God and to others in the way that we were created to be from the beginning. And that helps fill the void. So that's all we have about this. Next week, we are going to talk about the fall. And so please make sure that you subscribe so that you don't miss that episode. It's probably going to be a two-part episode because there's so much that we have to talk about when it involves Satan and ourselves and God, all three. And so we'll talk about that next time. Please feel free to email me any questions or thoughts that you have. My email address is Courtney at LiveThroughJesus.com. I will do my best to answer every email that I can, and if I get several on the same topic, I will probably address it in one of our episodes. Reflect this week on fulfilling your purpose. Talk with God. Talk with your spouse. See where you might need a little bit of work. Ask forgiveness if you need to ask forgiveness. Start anew. Don't let this discourage you, but let it encourage you to fulfill the purpose that God has intended for you. Again, next episode will be the fall, so make sure that you subscribe. Thanks, and have a good day.